All right, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the CDRE's uh, webinar series for this semester. Um, it's been a good semester so far, and this will be our December um, talk for um, this fall semester. So um, I'm delighted to welcome Isabel Granger all the way from Geneva, Switzerland, who will be speaking with us today. Um, so just a little bit about Isabel. Um, she joined the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, IFRC, in 2005. She is currently the Legislative Advocacy Coordinator in the Policy and Diplomacy Department of the IFRC. Her responsibilities with this include directly with the Law Disaster mm -hmm. Program, supporting the development of legislative advocacy initiatives by the IFRC and providing advice and quality oversight for IFRC advocacy, communications, and programming related to legal issues. Her experience also includes working as coordinator for the Americas of the IFRC Disaster Law Program between 2009 and 2016 and as IFRC's regional legal advisor for Asia Pacific between 2005 and 2009. Mrs. Granger holds graduate degrees in civil law and common law in addition to a master's degree in business administration, all from renowned Canadian universities. She is a registered lawyer at the Quebec Bar in Canada since 2001. Um, so, um, very good opportunity for her to speak with us today. And um, she's going to be talking about her title for her talk is Legal Frameworks for Disaster Risk Management um, Throughout the Red Cross. So um, without further ado, um, this is Isabel Granger. Hi. Hi. Sorry, I had started, but then my, my microphone was off. So yes, so I was asked this afternoon to talk to you about legal framework for disaster risk management. Um, this is an area of work the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Society has um, started to invest in since 2001. In this presentation, I will talk to you about the disaster law program of the International Federation. And as well, we will go through practical legal issues in international disaster operations um, and also recommendation that the IFRC, you can go to the next slide, uh, the recommendation that the IFRC has developed uh, globally in order to support, to support states legally prepare for the management of international disaster assistance. And we will then talk about the legal framework for disaster risk reduction. And there again, uh, recommendations that have been adopted at the international level in order to support states um, to, to, in, uh, in, uh, to mainstream disaster uh, risk reduction in their legal framework at the, in their domestic framework. And then finally, I will talk to you about a new project uh, um, so the development of a checklist online disaster preparedness and response. So of course I will welcome you to stop me um, everywhere you want. So I will be happy. I will be happy to take any question at any moment. So just uh, the, for the first slide. So the international. So why disaster law program and why the federation is uh, working on this. Well, legal frameworks are important in order to define roles and responsibilities of um, government, governmental actors responsible for reducing risk for the management of disaster, for the preparation and response to disasters, and they can play a vital role. And they can effectively save lives. So it's important to have a legal framework in place to minimize the impact of disaster to reduce disaster risk and also climate risk. So now we're talking more and more about the Paris uh, Agreement and its implementation. So it's more and more on the agenda of states to uh, in, uh, implement that, uh, them in their domestic context uh, 
um, the, 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 the Paris Agreement and as well to mainstream in their domestic context uh, the, redu the reduction of disaster and climate risk. Um, so next slide, please. It's actually, you, this slide you didn't see, but go ahead. No, this slide. Yeah, okay, next slide. No, sorry, the slide before. So um, the international, you can, go, you can go back. So the International Federation has started to work on um, the, to, so basically to look at legal framework for the management of international disaster assistance back in 2001. Uh, we have developed a set of recommendations for government. Uh, so this is what we refer to as the IDRL guidelines, so basically International Disaster Response Law Guidelines. And these recommendations are specifically to support uh, states prepare for the management of international disaster assistance. Um, there we also develop, we have also developed a set of recommendations for lawmakers on disaster risk reduction. Um, and we are in the process of developing a set of recommendations on law and disaster preparedness and response. And eventually, we also want to develop recommendations on law and recuperation to disaster. Um, and we have some research plan in this area uh, in 2018. So in our view, these are the four main areas of disaster risk management. But as I mentioned uh, before, actually you're way too far on. Huh? I think I'm still at slide two. So maybe you want to go back. I'm still introducing the disaster law program. Um, so, uh, so this is our view of disaster risk management. There are other, of course, interpretation um, in the literature as to what are the, the components and the main elements of disaster risk management. But at the International Federation, this is how we see the world, if I can say. So basically, we have divided our recommendation in, do, in these different categories. So the role of the Red Cross National Societies, Red Cross and Red Cross, so the, um, the International Federation is a membership organization of 190 national societies. Um, both Red Cross and Red Crescent around the world. Um, in the Americas, of course, the American Red Cross is the domestic uh, Red Cross National Society. And there are a total of 190 of these national societies globally. Uh, the Red Cross is, by law, auxiliary to the government in the humanitarian field. What it means, essentially, is that they're not an NGO but they're not a governmental entity. So they have been created by law. So it gives them a very unique uh, legal status. Um, and, and also the relationship with their government is very unique. So they have um, a mandate and a role to support their government in humanitarian questions. And in turn, they work directly with communities. They have a very much top-down um, um, uh, top-down, bottom-up approach. So basically, they, they were both with communities, making sure their voice is heard to uh, governments, and in turn, they provide direct support to their governments in disaster risk management, preparation, response, and disaster risk reduction. And so now we're finally on the same slide. So practical issues in international disaster operations. So you can change slide now. Next slide. So of course, at international level, there are uh, more and more uh, disaster, more and more frequent, and as well, their impact um, is 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 uh, more important than before. Of course, uh, this is in the face of climate change. And uh, what we've seen in the last few years is that there are more frequent, there are more and more uh, different international responders to these uh, frequent, uh, more frequent disasters. Um, the, it has become extremely difficult for government to manage the large influx of international disaster assistance, also because legal frameworks are normally not in place in order um, to coordinate and facilitate the entry of the international assistance. In many opportunities, the governments are being caught unprepared. 
Um, of course, this is not something that is comfortable. Uh, this is not a notion that is comfortable to deal with the fact that um, the government might not be able to respond to a domestic disaster and, and the concept that the government might need to request international disaster assistance. Um, it's often not a political priority, uh, so, so it can explain why uh, many states uh, are often uh, unprepared to, to manage the international disaster assistance. And next slide, please. So in 2001, we started investigation, global investigation, to understand what are the most common legal problems to international disaster operations. And uh, we had essentially uh, realized that uh, the, the, the legal problems can be divided into categories. So first, the legal problems that relate to the entry of the assistance. So we're talking of um, problems with visas, with goods being stuck at customs for, for months, um, a problem with the, the recognition of professional uh, qualifications, such as doctor, nurse, or other professionals problem with the entry of uh, the, uh, telecommunication equipment, uh, and so on. So to give you uh, an example of these types of problem, uh, after the fiscal earthquake in 2007 in Peru, uh, international teams of uh, doctors had to attend their patients in um, international water because they didn't have the recognition of their professional qualification in Peru. So really like a legal barrier that blocks the, the relief or, and the support by these medical doctors in the country. Another good example of that is, the, is, is regarding visa. So I was uh, in Indonesia in 2005 in uh, response to the tsunami operation, uh, the, the, the tsunami that hit uh, Indonesia in 2004. Um, and, and I remember we had to go out of the country every six weeks in order to get our visa renewed. So of course, this comes at a big cost to uh, the, 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 the international organization, but also creates a lot of delays in uh, giving the relief uh, and, and making sure that the, the people that need the help the most uh, receive the support that, that is needed. Um, another type of problem as well is problems with the quality of the international assistance that is coming in. So, in, so of course, um, it's often you know these the big earthquakes such as in IT, I'm not sure you remember uh, just a few years back in 2010, a major uh, earthquake. Um, uh, strike, stroke IT, and then there were this huge international response. Of, so responders with very, very good intention, uh, but unfortunately not all qualified. So, um, so there, it was reported that more than 10,000 uh, organizations, association groups, and even individuals came to support uh, the people of IT. Um, but unfortunately, not all were qualified. Not all understood. Uh, what are the agreed cooperation mechanism at international level? So there's a lot of good that were sent that were not requested, that were not needed, and this created blockages at customs. And of course, it became extremely difficult for um, for professional organization with the experience to provide the support that is actually needed. And it was even reported in that disaster that. 95% um, of the humanitarian relief was provided by 5% of international actors only, meaning that, um, that, that most of the relief was provided by only like a handful of, of experts, uh, international actors, but also meaning that there were many actors that should not have been there. And this created a, a lot of problems both for the authorities. Um, and as well, a lot of blockages at customs. So, so of course, all these these problems um, means that the aid is slower, slower that it, it comes at a great cost for for both the affected government, but also the international actors coming to provide that support. And uh, and 
ultimately then it is counterproductive and the people that are affected by the disaster are facing delays in receiving the assistance. Um, so at the international level, there is no comprehensive regime. So there is no there is no one central treaty that addressed all the rules of the game. So so there is no one treaty that says you know so this state should do that, this international actor should do that. So we're still we're we're in a very gray zone. So what exists is a different of uh, a number of different agreements. Sometimes they will be uh, they will be specific to one topic. As an example, the temporary convention is specific to the entry of telecommunication telecommunication equipment, um, but does not cover the full spe spectrum of international disaster uh, relief. Uh, also, in many opportunities, these um, international agreements are signed by a number of states only, but not by the international but by the entire international community. And as well, um, their implementation is very is uh, very can vary a lot from one country to another. So there again, this is another challenge. And normally these international agreements be between states do not include non-state actors. Meaning that all the NGOs that provide support after a disaster uh, do not fall under um, the, the, the provisions of these international agreements. So next, next slide, next slide, please. So, so you can click in order to see the picture up here. So based on this, the International Federation has um, uh, so has uh, developed a set of guidelines for government. So we undertook studies in more than uh, 2,000 countries. At the same time, we undertook a study of the legal framework in place at the international level in order to understand um, what exists and what is missing. And based on this, we have developed the IDRL guidelines. Um, they're the guidelines for the domestic facilitation and regulation of international disaster relief and initial recovery assistance. They have been adopted by states party to the Geneva Convention at the International Conference of Recross and Red Crescent in 2007. It is a non-binding tool, meaning that states don't have to, it's not a treaty, so they don't have to implement these provisions in their domestic context. However, they are state-of-the-art uh, recommendations They've been recognized internationally by the international community and they've been used by many countries since 2007 in order, um, so in order to strengthen legal frameworks for international disaster assistance. So you can go to the next slide. So since 2007, the International Federation has provided support to more than 100 states globally in order to implement in the um, domestic context the recommendation of these IDRL guidelines. So far, there are 30 countries that have adopted new laws and procedures based on the recommendation of these IDRL guidelines. And there are many more bills that are pending, uh, pending adoption. Uh, next slide, please. You can click again to see the images. So just to give you an example, in the EU, they have adopted what they call the Old Nation Support Guidelines. So essentially, they are guidelines that highlight key actions to be taken in relation to emergency planning, emergency management and coordination, logistics, transport, and legal and financial issues. They also propose a checklist setting out steps to address potential obstacles um, in annex to these uh, old nation support guidelines. So this is a tool that is available for EU member states in order to implement in their domestic context. Um, there are a number of states that have taken steps in the EU in order to implement these guidelines, which by the way are also based on the IDRL guidelines. Uh, the, a very recent example of that is Finland which has adopted the uh, IDRL law uh, just a few months back. And there are other countries such as Norway, which has 
adopted the new immigration law, which provides visa for military actors uh, in case uh, of international disaster assistance being requested by the country. So the, these are these are a few examples. There are also other countries that uh, so that have taken very positive steps in order to prepare their legal framework. Uh, one example is the Philippines. Um, so unfortunately, the Philippines. Uh, was hit by a very strong uh, typhoon in 2013, and at the time, the country didn't count with the regulation and um, uh, uh, procedures in order to manage international disaster assistance. So after the the, the typhoon hit, uh, they have established what is what we what is called a one-stop shop. So it's a very good model, very uh, practical. So essentially, it's um, so so it's, it's a mechanism in order to facilitate the entry of international disaster assistance. The way it works is that the governmental entity is responsible for the entry and coordination of international disaster assistance. They all sit together. So, as an example, immigration, customs, health, uh, disaster management, um, and so on. And they they actually. Uh, welcome international actors at entry points and facilitate on the spot all of the paperwork for these actors in order to be able to provide the required assistance in the country and at the same time to facilitate their registration mechanism uh, and so on. Uh, this, this model of the one stop shop was also implemented right after the earthquake in 2016 in Ecuador and it seems to be the new uh, the new model that states are following uh, it's a very effective model and um, and uh, it's, it's more and more popular and this is something that states are using more and more uh, if they are being caught unprepared uh, when a disaster strike next slide next slide please so, so at country level, unfortunately, there are still many, 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 many countries that remain unprepared for the entry of international disaster assistance. Uh, Vanuatu is another case of it. Uh, after being hit by a uh, tropical storm uh, Tom, they actually took positive action in order to prepare the legal framework for the management of international disaster assistance and actually just a few months after they were hit by tropical, tropical storm Donna and we, they, 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 were, uh, uh, they were able to notice uh, like uh, how legal framework can support positively the coordination of international disaster assistance so by having proper procedures and legal framework in place it did facilitate um, the response. And finally, and a last slide for this section, just to mention that these problems still persist. So we did a, a study in 2015 in order to understand what are the most common problems to international disaster operations and the problems of uh, uh, custom clearance and as well coordination problems, entry of personal, international personnel uh, remain uh, mentioned by uh, as very, very very important problems in all international disaster operations, and I will I will finish by saying that um, just actually so so yesterday was the 10 year anniversary of the adoption of the IDRL guidelines, and we're we're of course extremely proud of this great achievement, um, and we are organizing in Geneva the 10 year anniversary of uh, the adoption of the guidelines next. Tuesday, we are, we are organizing a high-level panel to discuss uh, challenges faced in the last 10 years, but also what's next for the, for the future, so what, what guidance is needed in, in, um, in this area. Um, and also we have developed new tools in order to help states implement these recommendations at um, national level. So these include a model decree, a model decree that I mentioned. That we had already developed a model app back in 2013, and we have also developed an advocacy brochure of the cases of Vanuatu, Ecuador, and South Sudan. Um, 
And um, finally, as well, uh, we have the ideal checklist, uh, ideal, ideal checklist and certain points that will be published uh, next week. So we have questions regarding this first section. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, I think you can just go with the second section and we'll just uh, do questions at the end. Okay. Okay, so you can continue. You can change, uh, you can go to the next slide. So here in this example is to highlight the importance of, uh, in this section is to highlight the importance of the Google framework for disaster risk reduction. So I will start by giving you four examples. The first one on the top left is uh, the Canterbury earthquake in New Zealand in 2010. It devastated the city of uh, Christchurch. So, um, of course, uh, many uh, buildings were destroyed by this very strong uh, earthquake, and um, and so it shows the importance of having good construct uh, building codes and say strong laws and regulations for building and construction. Uh, learning from this, the um, New Zealand government decided to undertake a review of the Building Act and introduce a number of reforms uh, which now require local assessments of building and a determination uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, and then either determination if they should be improved or demolished. Another example is the example of uh, Vietnam, the top right. So they have adopted regulation laws for disaster risk reduction. So they have um, established legislation on early warning, the, the establishment of dikes, drains, safe shelter, as well as community awareness activities. And it has led to a substantial reduction in life loss from flooding and storm. In the last 10 years, uh, they have these changes implemented resulted in the number of deaths from floods from from 600 down to 60, so a substantial improvement. Um, the other example, bottom left, is the example of Mexico. So Mexico undertook a cost benefit analysis of, um, the, of, of disaster, and they have realized that the cost of disaster was actually undermining their development, their national development. So they decided to shift completely from a response approach to disaster to a disaster risk reduction approach and comprehensive disaster risk management approach. They have introduced in 2012 a new civil protection law. Uh, so they, they really much focus on all the stages of uh, disaster risk management from disaster risk reduction, disaster preparedness, disaster response uh, in order to minimize the negative impact and economical impact of disaster in uh, their domestic context. And the last one is the example of France. So this is uh, quite interesting but also a bit controversial. Um, so this is uh, the example of a local official who was held account to failing to fulfill its uh, disaster risk reduction responsibilities. So this is back in 2014, and this mayor of a small uh, of a small seaside town in France was sentenced to jail for four years for ignoring flood risk before a severe storm caused flooding that killed 29 people. The court held the mayor uh, responsible because he had hidden the flood risk either not, in order not to deter interest from property developers. So of course this case shows that um, the water risk reduction is, is important but also it led to, so, to quite, quite interesting discussion at the global level uh, regarding the liabilities and uh, responsibilities of mayors and governmental officials in protecting their citizens from disaster risk. And at, you can go to the next slide. So at international level, there are there's no one international agreement that talks about disaster risk reduction. There are a number of landmark uh, instruments, policy instruments. Uh, the standby framework was adopted in 2015. Um, so it's priority to highlight the importance of strengthening disaster risk governance. Disaster risk reduction is also 
important in the sustainable development goals. There are 10 out of the 17 disaster, uh, sustainable development goals that relate to disaster risk reduction. And the Paris Agreement is not here, but it is also like a key instrument at the international level. And more and more, there are relations between these key instruments, the Paris Agreements and I framework sustainable development goals in order to understand what, what is common to these three instruments and support states implement these provisions in their national legal framework. So again, uh, the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction um, in, has four parties of action. And one of them is strengthening disaster risk government to manage risk. Um, we can go to the next slide. At international level, there are a number of binding treaties that relate to disaster risk reduction, but they are not specifically on disaster risk reduction. So these treaties relate to prevention. Um, they require states to take measures to prevent accidents, to put in place proper early warning systems, mitigate the consequences the consequences of accidents, as well as put in place legislative measure for implementing it. But there again, um, these agreements are very specific to some areas, to some sectors. So they're not comprehensive for all the, all the, the disaster and climate risk. I will not go into the details of all these agreements, but just for you to understand that these conventions are, are binding on states that have ratified them, that have signed them. So the, the states that have signed them and ratified them should implement in their domestic legal framework the provisions of these agreements. Next slide, please. So in, at regional, at a global level, regional agreements between states that are, are also becoming more and more important. And there are, there are 30 international, um, sorry, there are, there are 30 regional organizations globally. So basically, these are states that remove themselves at regional level and they agree to, uh, to, to, to disaster risk reduction agreement or comprehensive disaster risk management agreement at sub-regional level. Again, the scope of these agreements is very specific to the regional context. However, they, they do create binding uh, commitments on, on states that have to implement these provisions in their in domestic laws. So they're, they're also extremely uh, important, extremely uh, effective as well. But there again, they, 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 only, they are only between states at these regional levels. So you can, you can go to the next slide. So, so all these regional and international agreements that I've just mentioned, um, they set out responsibilities for states. However, they do not provide detail as to how to implement the provision at national level. So the International Federation, together with the UNDP, we have launched a study in 2014. We looked at the provision in place in 31 countries. We undertook a comprehensive analysis of the legal framework uh, in regards to disaster risk reduction in all of those countries. And uh, the, the, the goal was to give recommendation and guidance to states in order to strengthen the legal framework for disaster risk reduction um, and as well mainstream the concept of disaster risk reduction in all areas of the, of the government. We can go to the next slide. So some one of the main findings of the research um, is that, of course, the disaster risk management law is the key law, uh, is the central law when it comes to disaster risk reduction, disaster risk management. This law sets, pri sets priorities for, for, the, for the countries in terms of disaster risk reduction. It's also important to define the responsibilities of institution and it can even um, give specific mandates to, to government entities. It can also support 
communities in, in, in being uh, prepared for disaster, uh, so it support disaster risk reduction, education, and awareness, and so on. So of course, this is the legal basis for disaster risk reduction nationally. You can go to the next slide. So, so but this is not the so so here this slide to show that the disaster risk management law is not the only instrument that is important. There are a number of sectoral laws that are equally important. So in order for disaster risk reduction to be effective, the concept of disaster risk reduction should be mainstreamed in different areas, in different sectors, such as building codes, land use planning, environment, climate change adaptation, development approvals. So, so all these laws, all these different governmental entities that have responsibility based on these law should also have responsibility to mainstream disaster risk reduction in in the area of work. We can go to the next slide. So so other findings of the research is the fact that most governments have a disaster disaster management law uh, that are very much focused on response, not so much on disaster risk reduction. Um, also, the local governments, sometimes they have responsibilities for disaster risk reduction, but they often lack the means in order to implement the provision of the laws. Uh, there's also very few me uh, accountability mechanisms. So we just mentioned the case of this mayor in France that were that was held accountable for not fulfilling for not protecting its citizens against the risks of floods. But uh, normally there are very few accountability mechanisms that are provided in either civil protection law or disaster management laws. And again, uh, there's there's often a lack of clear direction on early warning systems and a risk mapping. You can go to the next slide. Um, another very important gap is the fact that in many opportunities, uh, the roles and responsibility between disaster management and environmental management or climate risk management is uh, separate in uh, legal frameworks, meaning there's a lack of coordination between these uh, governmental entities. It might mean as well that their, their duplication of their role or their gaps in their role there again, I mean, especially in the face of climate change, since climate is such an important driver of disaster risk, there should be better coordination, there, there, there should be better integration and connection between these two sectors and areas. And unfortunately, at the moment, it's not the case in, in most countries, if not all countries we have studied. You can go to the next slide. So, so based on all these uh, the studies, uh, this comprehensive analysis of the law in place in 31 countries, we have developed a set of recommendations for lawmakers. So this is the checklist on law and DR. So it was presented at the 32 International Conference, 32nd International Conference of Recross and Recrossing in 2015. You can go to the next slide. So it's a list in 10 points that gives guidance to governments in order to mainstream disaster risk reduction in their domestic legal framework. So it talks about defining the roles and responsibilities. It talks about early warning systems. It talks about um, sectoral laws that are very important, as I just mentioned, the role of communities, making sure they have a say in uh, the reduction of their own risk to disaster and as well access to decision making. Um, the, it, it proposes some recommendation about the funding of disaster risk reduction activities and so on. Um, you can go to the next slide. So the Together with the, the checklist on law and DRR, we have also developed an handbook on law and disaster risk reduction. So basically, this is a methodology for offered to states in order 
to strengthen their legal framework. So what we're proposing to this handbook is the whole of the society approach. So basically a consultative process at national level, but also including municipal and local levels to make sure that all actors are involved and included in the in the assessment, in the in the review of what are the current gaps at national level, but also in the recommendations that are provided to strengthen legal framework in order to mainstream disaster risk reduction. So you can go to the next slide. So finally, maybe here regarding this second section, what is important to understand and to remember is that uh, laws and regulations serve as a foundation for building community resilience and making people safer. Disaster risk management laws are important, but they're not Hi, Adam. Are you still Hello, there? I can hear you. Where have you lost me? Because I I, I don't know why it turned it turned off. <laughs> yeah, by not sure. yeah, you were logged in just fine, but the microphone I guess wasn't working. But yeah, you can continue. But where did you lose me? Um, at the slide right here. Uh, this slide? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay, so so I'm, I'm not sure exactly where you've lost me, but just to so basically to to finalize this last section, just to mention that that uh, so laws uh, and regulation are important in order to build re resilience of communities and make people safer. Disaster risk management laws are important, but they're not the only important laws. There's also there are sectoral laws that are equally important for risk reduction. Greater attention needs to be paid to resources, accountability, and implementation. And finally, uh, the checklist on law and disaster risk reduction provides guidance for reviewing and improving legal framework for DR. So you can go to the next slide. We'll just finish quickly this last section by mentioning that the International Federation, so when we were developing the sets of recommendations on disaster risk reduction and also international disaster response law, uh, we have received quite a, no a high number of re requests in order to, to develop recommendations on other areas of disaster risk management. Um, so we have started the development of a new set of recommendations for lawmaker, and this time on the domestic law uh, and preparedness and response. So we want to understand uh, the, you know, how what are the best practices in terms of uh, state of emergency, state of disaster, roles and responsibilities, coordination mechanism between different governmental institutions. We're interested by legal facilities as well. Um, uh, a new trend is the use of drones in disasters. So, so of course, with use of drone comes a, a number of important legal questions. Um, so, not all countries allow for disaster uh, disaster response uh, actors to use drones in their disaster operations for security reasons. So, these are some of the questions. Uh, you can go to the next slide. For us, we're also interested to understand um, so legal issue in relation to uh, sexual and gender-based violence. So just last month, we have finalized four studies. We look at the cases of Ecuador, Zimbabwe, Nepal, uh, in order to understand the role law can play in order to prevent this, uh, sexual and gender-based violence. Um, we know that the cases uh, increase significantly in post-disaster uh, periods. They are often unreported. And what we have, um, one of the main findings of the, these uh, research is that in, in, most, in, in, in all countries, well actually in those three countries that we have studied, 
there's a lack of uh, coordination between the entities that are responsible for disaster risk management and the entities that are responsible for gender equality and sexual and gender-based violence prevention. So in disaster response uh, settings, of course, if the, co if, the, if the coordination mechanism does not exist before the disaster strike, well, after the, the disaster strike, it's even more problematic when there's so much chaos and there's so much, uh, so much need. So one recommendation is, of course, to look at how legal framework can force this coordination, can force this co collaboration between actors, and as well uh, request that there are contingency planning for these types of cases uh, that, uh, that affect uh, many women in uh, disaster, uh, post disaster settings. So, so just to finish by saying that basically we're following a similar methodology, reviewing what are the best practices in place in a number of countries, together with a literature review and consultation with stakeholders, and we should be able to provide recommendation on this area of, of law uh, by the end of next year. So, so that should be all for me. If you have any questions, I would be happy to take any. If anyone has any questions, they can use their microphone or they can type in the chat room um, if there are any questions. Okay, we have a question from Robert here. Um, he says, thank you so much for the great presentation. Uh, he was just wondering, how did you land your current position there in Geneva? Well, like everything in, the, in life, it was a bit like, uh, you know, it was not planned. <laughs> um, so I, I started to do some development work in, back in 2003. I was in Rwanda and I was, um, I was actually uh, traveling on the coast of Kenya for vacation um, when the tsunami hit. So this was in December 2004, uh, Christmas time. So when I came back from 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 Rwanda, I was looking for a job, and basically I saw an advertisement. Uh, Red Cross was looking for a lawyer to advise uh, the disaster response operation in Indonesia. Uh, I applied, and I was supposed to go for six months, and then in the end. Uh, well, I've been working for the International Federation <laughs> for 12 years, so um, yeah, so so it was uh, I don't know, it was a uh, it was a little surprise in life for me, but uh, it turned out very well, and of course, it's very interesting. Okay, thank you so much. Sounds like a great journey. Um, I, have, I have a question. So you mentioned that there, you know, are more frequent disasters that are occurring internationally, and people are having to work together um, around uh, different countries. So, kind of, and you said, you know, politically it's not the priority, but you know, what are the challenges of this, and how are how are people responding to this? within the government and within, you know, the first responders? How are they responding to this um, major change here in disasters that we've seen? Well, I think it's, I think maybe the priorities are, become, are becoming a bit more on the table now, especially after the adoptions of the Paris Agreement just last year. Uh, first of all, governments have to take actions in order to implement the Paris Agreement in their domestic uh, framework. It's not the case for the other agreements. So the Sustainable Development Goals and the Standby Frameworks are non-binding agreements, meaning that they do not create a firm commitment on states to implement the provisions or the recommendation of these international instruments in their national context. It's not the case for the Paris Agreement. Paris Agreement is a binding instrument it means that the states that have ratified have to implement the provision of the Paris Agreement in their domestic legal framework. This includes mitigation action in order to to reduce the, the emissions of the 
of the of the CO2 in in the, the atmosphere, but also prevention actions in order to reduce the risk of disasters. So this is where it connects with um, this is where it connects with disaster risk reduction. So it creates positive positive um, obligations on states to 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 look into their domestic legal framework and adopt adopt and develop national adaptation plan that is called. So so the Paris Agreement will come into force in 2000. 20. And there is a there's a there's a lot of money on the table, um, 100 billion per per year that states have committed in order to reduce the um, the the emissions in the atmosphere, but also to to disaster risk reduction and disaster climate risk reduction. So of course, I think I think the priority is becoming more and more uh, a top priority for for government. Uh, more and more countries are facing catastrophic disasters. Just in the Caribbean, recently, three disaster, three hurricanes, category four. Uh, so, I mean, the the scale is completely different than what we you know we were used to in in past years. So, um, so I think the 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 states are becoming becoming more and more conscious. Uh, and also, the cost of all these disasters is extremely high. Um, there are different numbers, but I mean, some some studies suggest that you know the one dollar invested in 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 disaster risk reduction is actually a fifty dollar in disaster response. Of course, it's it's much more economical. Uh, there is much more um, and the cost benefit is is much higher. In investing in disaster preparedness and disaster risk reduction versus disaster response. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, definitely the hurricanes that we've seen in the Caribbean here in the United States have definitely uh, contributed to that. Um, we also have a question from Andrew that says, um, "What can the public do to help in these efforts?" So what what can the public do to help in these efforts? Yeah. Well, of course, I think the, the the of course the government they answer to concerns from the population, right? So, so so the the public concerns, the public voice, and um, so 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 there's there's a lot that is being asked by the population now to the authorities in order to take action. On these very important questions and international questions, in order to see change at national level, um, so we talk a lot more about um, the clean energy, about public transport, and so on. So to reduce emission, as an example. But again, I mean, all these all these mechanisms can be established by law. So in order to force disaster risk reduction, in order to force climate risk reduction. And so, of course, uh, the public voice is very important, and also communities can take a very active role in reducing their own risk to disasters. So, um, so it's possible to 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 reduce disaster risk at at uh, you know at at all levels, including um, public levels. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, I think that's all the questions we have for today. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Um, it's been um, a great session here with Isabel from the Red Cross. From the Red Cross, uh, we thank you very much, and um, we'll see you guys next semester. Have a okay. good day. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Have a good day. Bye.